Welcome to the Midwest Farm Report, brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organizations and their friends of this area. Today we have two national board directors of the NFO, Mr. Gene Potter of Illinois, Mr. Al Herman of Ohio, here to discuss the NFO and its position in today's economy. Now, here's Gene. Thank you. There's been a great deal of discussion about the NFO program and the objectives and how this is going to be carried out. Today, Al and I would like to discuss for a few moments with you the economic justification of such a program, why it's really necessary, and how that it will work into our present economic structure and the results of such a plan. I think for a moment we should review a little bit of the past and what leads us into the position we are today, what makes something such as this necessary. Now, today in agriculture, we are attempting to operate or to market our production in a competitive economic system or attempt to market it as if we were operating in such a system. Now, as we look in the history, we can see that in the beginning when farmers produced their production, they hauled it to market and sold it, that when you had a large number of buyers at the marketplace, that we had a competitive situation. But this actually began in theory to break down from the very time that the consumers quit trading with the producers directly, when they started even buying at the first general store. Although this was theoretical and it didn't at that time have too much effect on the price level in agriculture, of course, and it was operational. We could, in agriculture, return a fair profit for a good number of years, even until following World War II when we had approximately 100,000 independent grocers that retailed the majority of the food in the country. But today, we find this situation changing. We no longer have such <coughs> a condition with which we operate in. So it makes it necessary for some type of a structure to cope with our marketing problems today. And with this, I think that we should think a little bit about uh, what solutions have been offered in the past and what, uh, Al, would you like to discuss for a minute some of the things that we have, have been offered and just exactly what they have been able to do and what they haven't been able to do? Yes, I'll go into that briefly. Over the past uh, some years, many proposals have been advanced to meet these problems in agriculture. Now, we might say that these proposals fall into five general categories, government programs, cooperatives, the cry or the, the call for more efficiency on the part of the farmer. We might also say that the uh, suggestions were advanced that there would be fewer and larger farms. And then we get into the last category, the, the uh, so-called law of supply and demand. Now, we all know that the government programs were brought into being because there was a definite let down in the agricultural economy. However, I think we would have to agree that these government programs have not worked out to the satisfaction of the farmer and certainly not to the satisfaction of the general taxpayer. I think we can pass them over. Today, only a skeleton remains of these government programs. And it seems that uh, with the Bureau of the Budget adopting the position that they did recently, that uh, these programs probably will cease to be in the near future. Other proposals advanced were in the nature of cooperatives, farmer cooperatives. These, however, are somewhat limited in their application. It seems that they are more bound by the restrictions that have been self-imposed than anything else. They operate under, of course, the Capra-Volstead Act. But I doubt whether they have really answered these, have the solution to the farm problem at the present time. This more efficiency, of course, uh, this idea of more efficiency has been advanced. 
for some time. I think we will have to agree that this is a good thing, of course. We need to be efficient on the farms. But there's a limit. And when the efficiency has advanced to the point where you've practically reached the end of what you can uh, do, and your prices have not increased, then you must realize that there is some other factor that has entered into this. I think this brings us up to a subject that you would like to discuss, the so-called law of supply and demand, Gene. Well, thank you, Al. Uh, this possibly is a pet peeve of mine, and I hope that we can bear with this for a moment, realizing it is somewhat dry, but these are some of the hard facts that we have to consider when we're talking about a marketing structure. Now, as I mentioned earlier in a brief review of the past, we are supposed to do to uh, today to operate in a competitive structure. And by very definition, this competitive structure is one which the suppliers, none of which are large enough to affect the total supply, and the demand, or those purchasing the supply, none of which are large enough to affect the total demand. Now let's look for a moment at what we have in agriculture today. And I think there's no doubt in anyone's mind that as far as the supply is concerned, that I as a producer, if I never produced a steer or raised a bushel of corn, that it would not affect the total demand, or affect the total supply. The same can be said for the largest commercial feedlot in this country, that uh, anyone in New York City could still go to the store and the housewife couldn't tell the difference in the quality of meat in the showcase. So we cannot, as individuals, affect the, uh, the total supply. But let's look at the other side of the picture for a moment, as far as the demand is concerned. Take your largest meat packer that packs 18% of all the red meat in the country last year, and your second largest with around 12%. With your major retail chains of which today, or your chain interest retail, better than three-fourths of all the food in the country, with a handful retailing half of this. And there's no doubt in anyone's mind, if you took Swift and Company off of the market in a given day, or any large packer, that it would affect the total demand. But on the other hand, we can see that no individual producer can affect the total supply. So by very definition, we no longer have a competitive economic system. And supply and demand, as Al has mentioned here, as it is offered, as a solution or a price determining factor has to operate in a competitive economic structure to return a fair income to the producer. Now, let us never overlook the fact, of course, that we must take into consideration the demand for any given supply at a price. But I'm not speaking of this in the broad sense. When I speak of supply and demand being unoperative today, I'm speaking of it in the narrow sense as a price determining mechanism which has to operate in a competitive economic system. Well, uh, Gene, could I interject something here? I'd like to make the observation, too, that the law of supply and demand merely is a natural law, which uh, in effect says that a product is moved from the producer to the consumer where it is sold at some price. And this doesn't necessarily have to be a price that would cover the cost of the most efficient producer. This law of supply and demand has been greatly overtouted. Uh, it, uh, it will not produce, as I said a minute ago, an adequate price in most cases to even the most efficient producer. Do you agree to that? I think this is true. And there is something also that we should consider. And it is very important, I think, at this point. And a good number of times, those who think of a collective bargaining program in agriculture, wonder if we have actually considered this. And we realize that when you operate under the structure we are today, that the producer takes no responsibility for offering an even flow to the market, for uh, producing a quality product, or for taking care of any ter temporary overproduction. We realize that any time you consider putting a price, that these are three of the basic requirements that any organization pricing a product must accept. The same requirement that General Motors or 
DuPont or any major corporation in this country accepts when they put a price on their production. We also have to accept this in agriculture. And I think that a thorough understanding of this fact would make a lot of us more receptive to the idea of collective bargaining in agriculture, realizing that we not only have to produce this production we, and put a price on it, but with this advantage, we have some obligations. And one of these, of course, is the fact that we offer an even flow to the market, one of the most important. Today in our marketing system, we pay highly for this freedom to market as we choose. We pay it in the price. And if we're going to remove that lower price and substitute a higher price, then we have to offer an even flow to the market. This can be done by voluntarily uh, coordinating the marketing efforts of the individual producers throughout the area as they voluntarily desire, uh, desire to sell. As far as uh, a quality product, this has been to some extent established by your grade levels as far as the U, uh, USDA is concerned. But the producer must then uh, realize that when he is pricing this production, offering a certain grade for sale, that he has to attempt to produce this. And you, thirdly, must take the responsibility for any temporary overproduction, which the program and any collective par bargaining program must have incorporated in his plan. I'd like to revert just a moment uh, to this law of supply and demand and, and the things that are necessary to overcome its present operation. We must recognize the fact that uh, today the huge, um, let's call them the chain stores, have built up a huge volume buying power. Now this is not going to disappear overnight. In our opinion, the only way that we can successfully combat this type of uh, economic, what do we call it, economic uh, monstrosity, <laughs> is to build up a bargaining power of our own. The farmer must build a bargaining power. Now, in order to do this, he must organize. This is, entire, this is absolutely necessary in order to offset this huge volume buying power. I don't think we can dwell on that too much. This was brought to my attention by what you said a minute ago, Gene, about the uh, impossibility of the average farmer, or any farmer for that matter, no matter how large he is, of offsetting the uh, huge volume buying power of the chains. This is true. Uh, of course, you mentioned we, ha we must do this. Well, I certainly hope that we do, but of course, there are some alternatives which maybe we should look at for a moment, uh, none of which are very desirable as far as we as producers in agriculture today are concerned, but there are some other alternatives. Of course, you can progress to a socialized type of agriculture, which would in its own way solve some of these problems. But we in the National Farmers Organization are not in favor of such a program, and I'm sure that the majority of the producers in agriculture today are not in favor of agriculture being regimented and strictly controlled by government programs. I don't think that the taxpayer and the consumer is in favor of this type of program. I think a consumer, when he pays his grocery bill, he'd rather pay for it in the grocery store than on his tax bill. There is, of course, another possibility that we continue this so-called free type marketing that we're doing today, a new term that we've, uh, that's become prevalent in the last few months, uh, another term for supply and demand or a competitive economic system. This can continue if farmers are complacent enough not to take action themselves. If continued unhampered, uh, I'm sure that instead of having three and a half million farmers as we have today, that the programs are established, not established, but the idea and philosophy forward by the Committee for Economic Development, the uh, ideas that the uh, economic advisors to the present administration propose will definitely uh, offer some type of a solution. But what is this and what will happen? Well, if we remove two and a half million farmers, of the three and a half that we have today, 
you'll end up with a million producers in agriculture. Of course, of these, you'll have a similar breakdown. You'll have a small percentage producing a large percent of the production. And as this continues to progress, no doubt that there will be organized selling in agriculture. But the question is, do we do it today as family type producers or do we wait a few years and allow someone else to do it when we're working for them as employees or something such as this? And as far as the consumer is concerned from this standpoint, the consumer today is buying his food cheaper than he ever has in the history of this country or anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt that we within this organization are in favor of this. But we also have to consider that I'm sure when a small percentage of, or a small number of people produce the production in agriculture, that they're not going to be merciful on the consumer. And at that time, the price will raise. There will be a price in agriculture. But the question today, who's going to do it? Are we going to do it as individual farmers? Is the government going to do it? Or are large corporate interests going to establish this price? I think we would say that uh, a vastly more more preferable solution would be let's do it by organizing through NFO. NFO's announced purpose, of course, is to help save the family type farm. I think this certainly would be more appealing to the average farmer than to this socialized agriculture statement that you made makes me shiver. I don't like it at all. I don't know you don't. No, I don't. Free market? What have we accomplished under a free market if it were to be any more free? Of course, when we say a free market, we also mean absolutely no restrictions on imports, right? Well, I think this is certainly part of it. Uh, not specifically from a supply and demand standpoint, but it's certainly an implication. I think, Al, that there's something else that can be added here. Uh, when we talk about uh, justifying what any movement is. I don't think that you can justify uh, a social movement necessarily just to preserve the status quo or uh, to preserve the good way of life which some people in agriculture tend to believe it is and uh, I certainly there must be a lot of us that do or we wouldn't still be here. But there is an economic justification for this as far as efficiency of production and we've heard a great deal about this in the past and as we look for a moment uh, at the different methods of production in agriculture, we only, not only can look in this country, but in experiments and different types of uh, economies that are operating around the world today and in the past, I don't think there's doubt in anyone's mind that the most efficient productive unit in agriculture anywhere in the world is the family type operation. And those who are involved directly in this realize that it isn't an eight to five job. And for a producer to do the best job, he needs to have a direct interest in this. And when you move from this to where hired employees are doing the producing, then you lose a great deal of your efficiency, realizing, of course, that in particularly in today's marketing structure, where a large corporate interest can do a better job of buying, a better job of selling, uh, or means on any given day, maybe a, get a, a few cents more, a hundredweight, buy his supplies a few cents less, that as he is compared to the other productive units, he is doing a better job. But as far as the economy or the, his addition to our society, his production per man hour of labor is not as high. He is able to keep his costs down but his production per man hour, of, uh, per man hour his production for, per uh, dollar of investment is not as high because of the lack of interest of those involved. And even though this is a human factor and sometimes we tend to discount it, it's proved to be very significant in the production of agriculture, uh, not only in this country, but all over the world. And we've seen other types of systems tried and a gradual reversion back to where the producer has a direct interest in the production. Gene, do you think we should get in just a short time into the requirements of a modern day marketing system, successful modern day marketing system? I think that it certainly would be a good idea from the standpoint that we need to understand as producers just uh, what will be necessary to fulfill these requirements we're talking about. 
A few moments ago, we mentioned the first point. We must establish bargaining power. I think this is easily understood. Nothing can be done without bargaining power. At the present time, it's all on the other side. The farmer has no bargaining power, and this must be established. Another point is there must be one centralized bargaining association to bargain for all commodities. I don't think we can uh, continue to do this commodity by commodity. It hasn't proven very successful. Do you have any comments on that? Well, yes, I, this is quite obvious, and I think uh, particularly in uh, those who do not understand the, these requirements in agriculture. Look at this, and it's quite obvious that you cannot raise the price of any given commodity without raising the general price level of all commodities. Uh, so that there won't be shifting back and forth, and the man that is the most efficient in any commodity continues to produce it. So I think it's, right. it's quite obvious that this is true. You said that very well. Another point is that we must secure contracts with the processors. Without contracts, any gains made would be only on a temporary basis. I think we've had ample uh, examples of this in the past in various areas that I could quote. I won't say them at this time. Gains have been made which lasted a, a rel relatively short time. So contracts with processors must be secured in order to accomplish the uh, retention of any gains made. Another point would be there must be a system devised to uh, take care of excess production. Agree? This is quite true, and I think possibly that we should expand on this for a moment. Uh, a good many of us are concerned and have been in the past about raising the general price level in agriculture, which we are discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, this causing an overproduction of any given commodity or agricultural production in general. Now, I think there's a strong argument that can be forwarded from the standpoint that an increase in price will not increase production, particularly in the short run. And uh, those of us who do operate farm units realize that we have a certain number of fixed costs. And as our price goes down, our fixed costs remain the same. If your price per unit goes down, then you have to produce more units uh, to cover your fixed costs. Now, this, of course, is a short run thing, and it uh, is not the only consideration, but I think it's a quite strong consideration that a lot of us have overlooked. So from this standpoint, by increasing the price does not necessarily follow that you will have an increase in, increase in production. But let's assume that we do. Then we have to be prepared to take care of this. And very few examples, of course, you can use secondary markets, channel this production to markets that would not consume this ordinarily. You can Take livestock, for instance. Market livestock at lighter weights and cut down your tonnage. It isn't the head of livestock that's sold. It's the ton of beef, pork, mutton, lamb, or what it might be that's to be concerned. So I think that we definitely have to realize this is a responsibility. That's right, Gene. Another point is that we must uh, try to promote cooperation between producers. We all know that in the past, the farmer hasn't cooperated with his neighbor farmer any too well. This is almost uh, a saying, you know, they talk about the individual farmer. Well, there must be, we must promote this cooperation in order to be considered, for instance, as a reliable source of supply. And unless we have a reliable source of supply, we certainly will not have an effective modern-day marketing system. Yes, this, this cooperation situation, uh, we in agriculture for a good number of years and some still believe that those in agriculture is the strong individualist and he needs no one else. Uh, this has been agriculture's downfall. We do, do not compete uh, in the way that some consider. Uh, we compete with, against one another. Uh, since the farmer's machinery has been enlarged and become self-sufficient, he thinks that, that he needs no one. Well, there's one job that you do need your neighbor for yet, and that's to put a, pr a price on that production. You may not need him to plant the crop or to harvest it, but you need him to put a price on it, which is the most important part 
of your operation, whether some of us realize it or whether we don't. That's right, entirely right. Another point is that we must uh, offer, or the processor must offer, inducements for quality products. This is entirely necessary. Uh, at the present day, there are incentives in force in some, in most uh, products, but these incentives are not, in our opinion, great enough in order to establish a uh, more even supply. Yes, and there's another point here that is quite similar. As far as producers, we are distant, quite distantly removed from the consumer as such. And our education as producers breaks down at times. Now, we have learned to be quite efficient in agriculture. Uh, we improve our productive methods, but there is a gap in education as far as educating the producer as to what the consumer really demands, what the consumer needs. This is another uh, situation which, as organized, as a group, you can accomplish. As individuals, there just is no way in the world to do it. It takes group action, like a good number of things in this marketing situation. Do you want to get into this challenge we spoke about, challenge to agriculture? Uh, it certainly is a challenge in more ways than one, and I think that we should accept, recognize, and accept it. So. I think we must organize, uh, and let's say let's organize into NFO for the purpose of bargaining together, selling together, and pricing our agricultural production together. And then, of course, we must use holding actions when necessary to get the processors to sign a sufficient number of contracts. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, only a summary and a generalization, possibly, Al. I think that too many times, a reflection of this strong individualist in agriculture that we tend to believe we are. We think too much, I mean, as an individual, for our individual means, our individual ends. Sometimes uh, this is being a little theoretic and uh, over-emotional possibly, but I think it's something we should consider. The fact that we have a challenge not only for your family, and the economic future of productive units in agriculture, but for your economy as a whole. And as your political and social structure is based on the economic welfare of any economy, then you have a social responsibility. And there have been a good number of people in the past who have indicated that agriculture is the mainstay and the basic uh, base of any economy. Uh, we've progressed from this in this country as you industrialize, a lot of other situations become seemingly more important. But basically, 70% of your raw material production comes from agriculture today. We are still the largest as far as increasing the gross national product in this country in real income. So we do have a real social and moral responsibility to improve the health, so speaking, of agriculture in this country. That's right, Gene. This also uh, provides a challenge to NFO, we feel, since we've outlined the program under which this can be accomplished. It's a challenge to NFO to provide the leadership to farmers to finish the job. Thank you. Thank you very much. The Midwest Farm Report has been brought to you today by members of the National Farmers Organization and their friends of this area. For further information, attend local meetings in your area or contact the National Farmers Organization, Corning, Iowa. <laughs>